Welcome to episode 19 of Rail Talk. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. And we had to record this episode at a special time because John was going to be busy in New York City. John, I'm not sure if you're familiar with where I live, but it's part of New York City. You could have been sitting right here next to me. Yeah, but the car the car doesn't go to that side of New York City. It's 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 <laughs> Midtown, Wall Street, and then back home. Uh, Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. Um, Joe, th- the over under for this show lasting was was fourteen shows, and we both took the over. So congratulations to us and to to Anthony and 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 all of the people behind the scenes that that prop us up and make us look good because we proved everyone else wrong. Cash those tickets, baby. You can't get rid of us just yet. <laughs> We're like cockroaches. You can't get rid of us. All right. That's enough, John. <laughs> Real Talk is sponsored by Facing Tipton. We talked last week all about the Facing Tipton Night of the Stars, and obviously that is one of the marquee dates on the calendar in all of racing and breeding and sales. Um, so definitely make plans to be there next year for the 2024 sale. But there's action still to come. December 5th is the Mid-Atlantic December Mixed and Horses of Racing Age sale in Timonium, Maryland. And then there's the December Digital sale, which goes from December 7th to 12th. And I believe our buddy Johnny Green and DJ Stable got a few horses in that digital sale, as is there won't. We do, Joe. As a matter of fact, you know, the past two online sales have been so robust and strong for us uh, that we went ahead and we put six more horses in the uh, in the sale, including Sharif Ali, who won very impressively first time out um, and is undefeated up in Canada. Um, and our Philly YMCA, who actually it's good for the sale because she won in a main special weight race and was DQ'd and, fin- and and placed third. So she's never been off the board, but now she's got that juicy maiden best friend still sitting there in the, in the, uh, in the, the cockpit with her. So um, lots of good horses. And you've seen over the, over time, just how well and how robust these sales have been for Phasic. And Joe, you know, you're a handicapper. You've seen a lot of these horses that were in the sale and three, four weeks later, they're on the racetrack and they're winning. Yeah, and we talked about the growth of those sales, and Facebook has been on the, at the forefront of that. They were one of the first ones to really dip their toe into that sector of the auction world, and they do a great job. You got all the info you could possibly need. And, you know, like John says, it's great not to have to pull the horse out of training to send the horse to the sale. Turnkey horses, that's December 7th through the 12th, all online, obviously. And then don't forget about the December mix sale. And before you know it, we'll be, we'll be there next spring and summer for all the yearling sales at Saratoga and in Lexington. So we are so thrilled to welcome back this next guest to Rail Talk. She's always willing to come on and answer questions. That's what makes her great at her job. The CEO of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, Lisa Lazarus. Thanks for coming back on. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. I love this podcast. Thank you so much. That, that means a lot. And uh, we wanted to have you on in particular this time, you know, in the aftermath of the 60 Minutes piece. And we gave our opinions last week on what we thought, what we felt like the piece left out and got wrong. But let's hear it from someone who was interviewed on the story. You know, just what was your overall reaction seeing it as opposed to when you recorded it? You know, obviously, you know, CBS is a sort of unique long term program and they have their editorial store, you know, style and, and how they like to produce segments. Um, for me, you know, my interview was about two, two hours long. And so there was a fair amount of discussion and content that I would have loved, you know, to see included. I understand that, you know, they have limited time. But I did talk extensively about all the progress um, that the industry has made. With regards to safety, both prior to HISA was when it started, Um, but then, you know, certainly subsequent to HISA launching its racetrack safety program, you know, we've seen, you know, veterinary protocols sort of standard across the country. We've seen a lot of just uniformity and all of the the, the sort of different elements that we need to put in place um, for racetracks to be safe. And, you know, I would have loved to have more of that content included, obviously. Yeah. And Lisa, you know, it really was the the show was very polarizing within the industry. Some people thought it was very balanced and fair. Other people thought that um, it was just, you know, it, it was basically they were putting up horses there uh, that broke down for sensationalism. When you watch the piece, knowing that you were interviewed for two hours and that, um, you know, the head of the jockey club was interviewed and and, uh, you know, others were, were interviewed. 
within the industry and outside of the industry. Were you surprised with the slant that they that they took, or do you think it was it was kind of fair and equitable? You know, I I wasn't surprised. I knew that um, you know they had secured the the footage of the wiretaps, and that was going to be a central element of the story, and. The reason why I agreed to go on, you know, the show was that I even realizing that there were some risks with the angle they might take, et cetera. I realized that, you know, the story would be better with Haiza in it, you know, than without that, that, you know, whatever slant they took, sharing the fact that the industry now had, you know, one uniform set of rules and a national regulator, um, you know, certainly showed progress. So, you know, that was kind of the thinking behind the decision to participate. Um, you know, it's hard for me to I'm not you know, I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm biased, obviously, because I, I know all the hard work that, you know, my team puts into safety and, and trainers across the country. And so, of course, I would have loved to have seen some of that, you know, emphasized more directly because uh, that was very much, you know, part of the story that I was trying to tell. But obviously, they're limited in, in time what they can tell. And they really were focused on, um, I think, the prosecutions from March of 2020. And, you know, I think you, you shared this, uh, I think, on your segment last week. But I was interviewed in early June. So it was really quite quite some time ago as well. So, you know, we had just started the anti-doping program maybe a week earlier. Um, and so some of the progress, even that we've had since then, you know, hadn't yet materialized. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, the way it was presented was as if this were May 2020 and the indictments had just dropped and we were scrambling and, you know, you know, we had this uh, this mechanism in place, but it hadn't really been set up or in effect yet. You know, just in terms of the questions that they asked you, did you get that sense that that's kind of the story that they were driving at or did it seem more fair in the questions and then later it was presented in a different way? The way that I anticipated it would sort of roll out was they were going to use, you know, the prosecutions of May of 2020 as essentially, you know, a, a story starter as a way to look at where the industry had been. Um, I was aware that, you know, they were going to, you know, use the wiretaps and that evidence. But I also believed that the sort of flip side would be that's where we were. But here's where we are now where we are now is in a much better place. You know, one of the things that um, I thought, you know, I would have also loved to have seen highlighted is that Sean Richards, who was interviewed extensively, um, you know, because he had been intimately involved in, in those prosecutions, is now a critical HIWU employee. He's now working very much for our anti-doping effort. And I think the public, if they had kind of made that connection, would have potentially given more assurance. And I was you know, disappointed. I don't know what the thinking was, but that that wasn't ultimately included in the story. Right. No, it's an excellent, excellent point. I mean, it, it sounds like over the time, not only are you making progress in um, the safety um, um, initiatives for the horses, but you're bringing on a lot of good talent. Um, and, and and I really feel like that that's, you know, part of the part of the the, the upside of Haiza is the fact that, you know, you're bringing people in who know what they're looking at. They know what they're looking for. Um, with that in mind, is, is it without giving away any company secrets? Um, it, are there bigger name trainers and owners that are maybe coming down the that, that, that maybe are having going to have issues coming down the pike? Because the one complaint that I've heard um, from people is that, OK, they're getting some of the small fish, um, but it's not making the impact that we had hoped it would in the industry. Again, don't name names or anything like that. But but are there bigger fish that we should expect in the coming weeks, months, years that 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 will uh, that will show up as, as being you know proven to be a, a bad apple? So, listen, like Rome obviously wasn't built in a day. This is, you know, mm -hmm. our program is entirely new. Um, it's never been done before in horse racing. And there's a lot of good work that's been put into kind of building the right program. Um, I do think, you know, that over time we're going to be able to identify the, the real sort of integrity issues in the sport, um, primarily through investigations and through other tools. Um, you know, our, our, our testing is getting better and better, but that's an evolution and we're working closely with the laboratories. I think one thing I want to say, because, you know, Haiza, we're so often in the reactive position where we have to be kind of defensive about why we did this, or why we did that. And I don't get a lot of chances to be completely proactive. Um, and I'm trying to kind of 
think differently about how we talk about Haiza going forward. And you made me think about one thing that I think is so important, which is that the staff at Haiza has been in racing, you know, forever. You know, we've got the Mark Guilfoyles, the Jennifer Durnbergers, the Emma Governs. I mean, we have really people who live and breathe racing and came to Haiza because they want to give back, because they care so much about the industry and the horses. And the one thing I really want people to think about and, and understand and, and sort of give Haiza credit for is that we are solely dedicated to racing. We're not about gaming. We're not about state government. We only care about horse racing. And we are really available 24-7. I mean, I, we get calls at 4 a.m. We get calls at 11 p.m. You know, and we answer. We really answer within, you know, within uh, usually within the hour, sometimes within 24, but very, 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 very quickly. And I think that's something that's very unique in that that wasn't the case previously with state racing commissions. Obviously, you've got state government employees. I'm not saying that, you know, none of them were available, but not with that same kind of dedication. And also with that same just desire to really get it right. And we've been able to do things, particularly in the ADMC program recently, very quickly. It would, wouldn't be infeasible at all if you're working through a state government. You know, we, we sort of launched this program. We put a ton of thought and effort into doing, making it right. But until you launch something and you kind of see it play out, you really can't necessarily think through every possible permutation, right? And like Murphy's law is always the thing that you didn't think about is going to be the thing that that ultimately <laughs> sort of rears its head um, at the outset. And so we've been able to, to really be thoughtful and to react to the industry and to be fair to horsemen by making adjustments as they happen. And the industry needs to realize that that is something that's really unique and was not there before. You could not do that under the prior system. Um, yeah. So... Yeah. I think that's an important thing to just recognize. Yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the things that we've stressed on this show is adjusting the ejection rules and just being able to pivot quickly when there's something that doesn't work, I think is a huge, huge benefit to the industry. And like you're saying, something that didn't exist before. You know, I'm curious because you've been in this job now for over a year. You know, you, you have the benefit of hindsight a little bit. You can compare then to now. You know, I saw we talked about this letter from the HBPA last week about talking about how all it's, most of its members are anti Haiza, and I'm like, what's your data to back that up? So just give us your anecdotal data. Judging from the beginning of the program to now, are people in the industry more willing to work with you guys? Uh, like 110 percent, and I really don't accept by any means the majority of horsemen are against Haiza. There certainly are horsemen against Haiza. I'm not denying that. But my experience lived every day is that it is nowhere near the majority. Um, and I do think there's been a transition, you know, partly in the beginning. I think I think a lot of people weren't sure that we would stand the test of time, that we would make it to the litigation, et cetera. And so they were sort of in a bit of a wait and see. Um, also, you know, I think there's a bit of a trust issue. And with a lot of people, I think we've built trust over time that we're going to listen, we're going to bring in horsemen, we're going to hold racetracks accountable. And that's one thing also that's really important is that, you know, what I hear from horsemen a lot is like, why is it always us? You know, why is every problem in the industry our fault? You know, and I don't think that's true at all. I think horsemen have a responsibility, like every actor in the industry, but so do racetracks and so, do, so does Haiza and so do, you know, owners and so do breeders. So, we all have a role to play. And I think, you know, that that's something that I hope and believe has been sort of recognized, you know, over time. And I think every day we get more and more um, support or, or at least recognition that we're here to stay. The thing that I always say is like, I don't care. You could be against every rule. You could hate what we're doing. But if you accept the concept of highs and you're willing to tell us what you don't like and engage with us, then that's good. That's all I need. You know, I just need right. engagement and I need everybody that comes to the table to make it as good as it can be. And I really think at this point in time, it's a shame um, that the HGPA is still not willing to engage in that conversation and come on board because we'd be much stronger and better if we had the benefit, you know, of their input um, on, a, on a daily basis, on a regular basis, and in a really, you know, in a productive, constructive way. 
And, and Lisa, again, uh, credit to you. We did reach out to others that were in the 60 Minutes piece and and with the HBPA, and, and you were the only one that was willing to come on with us. Um, I like to think it's because Joe is so difficult to deal with on these interviews. <laughs> but but in reality, you know, we give you a lot of credit for for standing up and, and being out in, in front of all this. Um, you mentioned before just now about um, racetracks and the fact mm-hmm. that they should, you know, they have to take some responsibility. Sure. What what legal purview does HISA have over the racetracks? And, and, and the second question is, um, what legal uh, purview do they have over vets, blacksmiths, farmer reps, you know, basically anybody who has access to, to the barn areas. Right. Um, do you, do you have any uh, legal ability? Yeah, absolutely. To so firstly, the racetracks under the racetrack safety program, they have to meet our accreditation standards and there's a whole sanctioning regime in place um, for us to essentially, you know, implement if they don't, right? And there have been a number of racetracks um, since we've launched where we've required them to make repairs, to make adjustments, um, to let our experts come in, look at their service, et cetera. And, you know, to be fair, the vast majority of racetracks have been really cooperative. Um, and, 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 you know, in a lot of ways, I think there's an appreciation for that somewhat objective actor, to come in and sort of look at the whole landscape and try to get everyone on the same page. Obviously, racetracks, you know, are not going to be identical. You're not going to have like a, you know, a racetrack in Indiana is also going to look like a racetrack in Kentucky. But there are genuine uniform standards that we hold racetracks accountable um, for the safety of horses and and jockeys. And so we do have that legal authority. Um, With regards to veterinarians, absolutely. I mean, if you look at on HIWU's website, you'll see there are a number of veterinarians that have been suspended or provisionally suspended. Um, As long as you are somebody who interacts with covered horses, which is any horses, any horse under HIWU's purview, which is any horse that's had a timed workout or or a race, um, then we have the legal authority um, over over that over that actor. Now, our legal authority is not to like you know throw you in jail. Obviously, our legal authority extends only to restrictions on the ability to participate in horse racing, right? A third right. horse racing, right. right? And and just Joe, let me just jump in one more question. Does that also include um, two year old sales? So uh, currently, it does not include to it. We're not exerting our authority. However, um, you know, we're in conversations with the three sales companies um, working towards uh, an aligned program for anti-doping at the sales um, that'll that'll kind of more closely fit into sort of Heise's, Heise's purview and perspective, which is great. And I'm really I'm very grateful to the three sales companies for coming to the table and having those conversations. I think it's really important. I mean, as I said, I, I really, you know, I genuinely do not believe. Um, and if anybody who's spoken to me will know this, that horsemen are the only act, you know, entity that's responsible for safety. You know, racetracks are, breeders are. And so I, I'm really, you know, I'm really pleased that the sales companies, you know, want to play a role. Yep. Oh, for sure. That's a big deal. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, we talked about on the show about the the John and Diane Pimentel situation, and there was a lot of reporting about that. Um, I thought based on the reporting, it was kind of heavy handed the way that that was handled. But obviously, I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Can you do you can you just give a sense of, you know, what how how accurate the reporting is and then whether or not you guys regret anything with the way that was handled? So, sure. Um, so first of all, it is still an ongoing case. So there's some details I can't, you know, in fairness to them, I can't really share. But what I will say generally is, um, you know, the most objective thing um, imaginable within our program is a sample is taken from a horse and it goes to a laboratory completely anonymized. Right. And in that laboratory, when it comes back positive, we don't know is this a good person, a bad person, is a small trainer, a big trainer. The, the, you know, the, the, the trainer or the owner is just notified um, under our rules. So that's what happened with the Pimentals. Um, you know, I, yes, we would, I wish I had known about that case before it ultimately was reported on because, you know, we have sort of intervened to give people help where they need it. And I think what happened with the Pimentals is they felt so overwhelmed by the system that they just decided to agree and sign to accept their consequences. You know, um, Mm -hmm. they were one of the, so they're one of the earlier samples um, that was taken. So one of the earlier cases, especially with regards to a human 
drug um, of abuse, which is methamphetamine. So since that time, um, we've put in place, I think, two really important measures that they're directly benefiting from. Um, and, and it was these were sort of already in play, but but the Pimentel story really emphasized how important it was to 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 implement these measures. One was to put Alan Foreman in place as the ombudsman. So Pimentel is that they couldn't afford an attorney. They felt confused. They could contact Alan and he would walk them through exactly what they had to do and how they had to communicate. Because it's very we can't high move can't reach a settlement or dismiss a case unless they engage with with the covered persons to understand what happened. Right. So Alan Foreman is really important for that communication. And then we put in place something that I had actually wanted for a long time, but we just hadn't had the resources yet to make happen which is the pro bono panel for, for trainers or, or owners who don't have the resources to hire a lawyer. So right now, the Pimentals, they've had the benefit of Alan Foreman. Um, they have actually been assigned what I think is one of the best anti-doping law firms in the whole country, who's on our pro bono, bono panel, which is Howard Jacobs Law Firm. Um, he is you know, notorious for being a very capable lawyer across anti-doping. And so they've benefited from that. Um, and they've also benefited from um, the the rule the the, the rule adjustment in the new set of rules that we've submitted to the FTC um, that treats human drugs of abuse differently. So uh, they will be able to benefit from those new protocols. So you know, I'm hoping that's going to be resolved in a way that's favorable. I can't get involved directly in a case once it's going through the legal system, but what we have tried to do, and I think we've done it successfully is give people like the Pimentals the tools they need to tell their story properly, right? right. And then right. once they tell their story, I'm confident that they're going to be treated you know, fairly in the way that, they, that, it, should, that it, it should play out. So yes, I, I wouldn't have wanted it to play out the way that it did. Um, and while I feel sorry for the experience that the Pimentals had, I am somewhat grateful to them, even though I didn't love it when it happened, obviously, but grateful to them for bringing their story to the surface so that we could make the adjustments that we did. Right, right, right. Now, that, that, excellent. Um, I, could, I have two more quick ones, and, and sure. Joe, you can be sandwiched in between. Um, Lisa, number one is I explain to me picograms and trace amounts of of, of uh, contaminants uh, like like I'm a five year old because I get we get asked this all the time and they're like people are people say to me oh there was two picograms and the horse is 1100 pounds how could this not be traced you know and if, yeah. if you tested the drinking water you would see there were picograms of every drug in the world and you know blah 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 and I, you know I, I don't know how to I don't know how to answer that or defend that because I'm not a scientist so sure. explain it to me. Like I'm the five year old that I am. How sure. like what exactly I'll do is my a best. I'm, not, and, I'm not a scientist, but he, here's <laughs> here's you know, I'll borrow one of the one of the analogies that Mary Scalia always makes is first of all, picograms it, it's just a weight, right? It doesn't talk to the potency. It doesn't speak to, you know, the administration. So, you know, she always says a pound of broccoli and a pound of chocolate are both a pound, but they have very different properties and very different tastes and, and all of that. So the picogram thing is really I think typically very misguided and a misnomer. Um, let me take the, the doping substances. Those are substances that should never be in a horse, right? So for some of those substances, if they're not likely to be a contaminant, a picogram is still an indication that maybe you used it two, three weeks ago, a steroid or whatever it is, but you were never allowed to use it. So that's still relevant and we still need to understand what happened there, right? With regards to contaminants, I think we have two very um, compelling and, and, and positive programs for, for trainers. The first is the atypical findings policy, and that's for environmental contamination. We've got 29 substances there. And if your horse tests positive for one of those, and we've had 25 of these cases so far, there's an investigation that HIBU conducts. We don't rely um, exclusively on the, on the horseman. The HIBU conducts. And if they find that it's more likely than not that it was contamination, it's like the case never happened. And the reason why we don't get the benefit of trainers and the public knowing that is that we don't make them public to protect the trainers and the owners. So nobody ever knows they happened if we dismiss them. So we've had about 28. Um, I, I think we've had maybe 15 or 16 resolved. Of the 15 or 16 that resolved, only one proceeded to be an, an adverse analytical finding. So the vast, vast majority of those get dismissed. 
Separately, we recently, um, through the new rules and then using our um, our kind of authority, you know, our discretion whether or not to enforce something, because we have to wait, obviously, for the Federal Trade Commission to approve our rules. But we changed the human drugs of abuse approach to if it's methamphetamine, if it's cocaine, if it's if it's a THC marijuana, um, we look at it as really a 90 day sanction um, at, at the most, you know, because normally for banned substances, we start with a two year and then you can bring it down. For those, we start with 90 days, which if you admit, you automatically get 45. But if you have an explanation for where the source came from, you can, you'll get far less. Um, and we've had situations where, you know, we've tested, for example, personnel in the barn of a trainer, you know, four of the employees has a positive for meth. That's a very, you know, that's obviously a reasonable explanation. And, and there's a lot of mitigating, you know, mitigation there. And so the, the sanction is, is very low. I, I do want to say, though, that I, I am very committed to dealing with the meth problem on the backside. And mm-hmm. I don't feel like it's a good long term answer to these types of cases. I don't think in any workplace having meth would be like, oh, no problem. It's just acceptable. So I think just like I said, we all have a role to play. I think we all have a role to play in trying to support anybody on the backside that's struggling, but also eliminate meth or cocaine from our workplaces. Yeah, no doubt. Um, last question for me, and this is something I brought up on the show before. Uh, do you guys have any input that you take from horse players, whether it, whether it's, you know, investigative work or, you know, because I, I thought about that with the Pimentel situation was that, you know, most horse players could have looked at them and told you these guys, these people are not cheating. Now, that does that Does that mean they should be let off the hook completely? No, I'm not saying that. But I think context is important when you guys are thinking about who, you know, is in your crosshairs, for lack of a better term. Are there horse players that you guys are speaking to? Is there any data that you guys are using from horse players to to aid in your investigations and your sanctions? Uh, I'm going to answer that question in a second. But I just want to just address one um, one thing you said that I don't fully agree with, which is. While the program is in place primarily to deal with cheaters, that that's not the only objective. There's also a horse welfare objective, you know, like part of why we ban thyroid is that there's evidence to show that it's very dangerous to horses, that horses have died because of thyroid. So it's not purely a cheating um, approach. It's also a horse welfare. And the other thing that I also I'm going to kind of, you know, borrow from John, because I, he said this for, on the on the uh, podcast we have to get away from the good guy, bad guy thing. You know what I mean? Like we can't, we have to be totally objective. Part of what I didn't love about the prior state system is that in some places, there was just a lot of local influence on who got better treatment, who got inside information. You know, we are completely agnostic. You know, we report things as they happen. So, and the minute we get into trying to evaluate who's not cheating, who is cheating, it's a very slippery slope. That being said, to answer your question on gamblers, absolutely yes. Um, Haiwu and the investigations team interacts regularly with, with the gamblers. And we definitely use the statistics that they can share about how they handicap, et cetera, and sort of throw it into the pod of information that Haiwu uses to try to determine what the most effective, you know, test plan should be. So, you know, absolutely. I actually, I, I think we should on the safety side too engage more with horse players. And that's something that's on my list to do more in the future. So I do think they're a group that we could, we could be using, you know, sort of their talents and their insights more than we are. But on the anti-doping side, um, they're definitely being, being used and their knowledge is being integrated. That's yeah, I just I just think because horse players in a lot of in a lot of situations are kind of like the first line of defense because they're paying yeah, attention yeah, to races yeah, all around the country, whereas yeah. like certain jurisdictions are probably only focused on what they got going on. So I, I think they're good in terms of having a broad scope on what's going on. Go ahead, John. Yeah. No, and, and Lisa, just so you know, Joe and I have spoken off air about this, but since you've been em- employed and in place, um, we have not seen the rebreaks of horses like we had, like we did in in the past, like, you know, and and again, not naming names, but there were certain trainers where, you know, the horse was finished at the top of the stretch and all of a sudden it won by three Um, or, you know, horse would get claimed and all of a sudden it would, it would move up the ladder, you know, 20 lengths. We're not seeing that nearly as often. So, so if nothing else, there's definitely um, some influence that, that trainers are being concerned about the testing. Um, What's your biggest surprise after being here at the helm for a year? You know, my biggest surprise is that um, we can't get everyone on the same page. 
You know, we have um, we have a universe where, see, I live like half in the outside world because I have to deal with all the incoming media, the national media, the welfare organizations, the, you know, all of those organizations. I have to deal with the Hill. I've got to deal with the Federal Trade Commission. So I don't operate solely in our silo, right? And I can tell you that horse racing is at a moment of reckoning. You know, there is a lot of external pressure to either change how we how we conduct the sport or eliminate it entirely, okay? And so the NTRA is working very hard on that all the time. That is something that I have to be acutely aware of. So while I have to be very sensitive to, to horsemen, I have to also make sure that we're satisfying the Hill, DC, horse welfare groups because we need to make sure we don't do anything to essentially put our sport in danger, right? right. What I don't understand yeah. is how any horseman or actor in the industry could think that it is helpful to their long-term success to oppose Haiza. Okay. As I said, you can argue with me about anything, you know, there, I'm willing to hear about any rule that you don't like or how we should modify it. But if we don't unify as an industry, we're going to be, we face really big risks externally. And to me, it's like, potentially winning the battle, but losing the war. Like, where does it get you? You know, if, right. if the litigation is successful against Haiza, right, and, and we cease to exist, we're repealed, where does that get you? You know, right. I mean, I, I honestly, based on what I have to do on an almost daily basis to defend the sport, I can tell you that I don't have confidence that it will be around forever if that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm, you know, we've really tried to be approachable, you know, at Haiza. You know, we have Dr. Dr. Doug Daniels, who's the National HGBA president on our Horseman's Advisory Group. You know, I try to engage as I can. We need to have difficult conversations, robust conversations, but we need to unite because it's just it's dangerous otherwise. Listen, approachability is the key. Like anybody who listens to you speak knows that you're an open minded person and willing to adjust and shift. And that's, you know, that's all you can ask for. And I, I know that your heart is in the right place and your team's heart is in the right place. So we appreciate you as always coming on, answering questions. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Rail Talk is sponsored, as always, by The Green Group. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody, all of our friends at The Green Group. You know, time is ticking, guys. If, you, if you're waiting until April to get those tax savings, you waited too damn long. We got about five, six weeks left in the year. Got to got to know all about those deductions and claim them on this year's tax returns. And if you want to do that, if you want to know how to navigate all of the you know intricacies of the horse accounting world, hit up Len Green and the Green Group. They do it better than none. And I say this honestly, not just on the air because they're a sponsor. I have West Point people who come to me sometimes and ask about tax deductions and who they should speak to. And just instantly, my mind goes to Len. It's the best in the business at what he does. The firm is terrific. They've been doing this for decades. They know the business because they have over 800, they've over 800 clients in the horse business. They've owned horses for decades, owned and sold horses. So there's simply nobody better in terms of the expertise of being in the horse business and the accounting expertise that you can go to greenco.com, hit them up. Len will give you a consultation, which is always entertaining. I get kind of a free consultation every time I'm with him. And he, he teaches me all sorts of things about business and the horse business in particular. It'll be a font of knowledge for you. Go check them out, greenco.com. Wanted to piggyback a little bit off of that Lisa interview, and it was one of the questions that John asked towards the end, which I have been thinking about and noodling over for a little while, which is that you just don't see horses really re-break and do and defy physics like they used to. And that was a big problem in racing when you just, you know, especially as, as a horse player, it just drives you nuts when you feel like you got the right horse and then somebody does something that you know is not natural and you just feel like beating your head against the wall. Like, why do I continue to do this? This is not a level playing field. This is not on the up and up. But I don't really see that much anymore. You know what else I don't see? I don't see the big move ups off of the claim that I used to, you know, where horses running 20 points faster than they were. Or and I see this still still sometimes. But I think a lot of the one of the real markers of juice guys is when horses start finding career best form at like age six. 
and seven and eight. And I still see that occasionally, but very, very rarely and not nearly as frequently as I used to. I'm curious from John's perspective as an owner, because John and, and DJ Stable have been known to pull up stakes and leave tracks when they feel like they are going against people who are taking an edge. Think of Parks and Monmouth back when they had service in Navarro. It seems to me like a much different world, John. I don't feel I have the have the data necessarily to back it up off at, at, at hand right now. But anecdotally, doesn't it just yeah. feel like you got a much cleaner shot at this? It definitely does, Joe. And, and, you know, case in point is, um, it, you know, we're, we're much more open to running in all venues. Whereas in the past, it was like, all right, well, we'll think about entering a horse at this racetrack, but let's see if XYZ and, you know, show up in, in the entries. Um, so we're not seeing that nearly as much. Uh, the playing field is definitely more level. I think that there's still some people out there that, that are taking a little bit of an edge. And, and if, quite frankly, if, if the testing and the investigative, you know, research of Heise isn't there or doesn't continue to be strong, um, then it'll just naturally creep back to the way it was. So I'm glad to see that that uh, you know, especially in our interview, Lisa reiterated the importance of the investigative part of mm -hmm. of Heise with it. Um, and Joe, you know, again, a, another perfect example is you look to see these horses and they run, win a big race, and then they retire. And, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you that Archangelo um, was sold out very quickly after retiring um, because I think the, the breeders and, the, gen and the, the general public see that horse as winning those grade ones on his own merit. Um, they weren't enhanced. He didn't have a second break um, during a race. And uh, Jen Antonucci has a very good reputation in the industry as far as being, uh, you know, a, a good, solid, clean, you know, uh, hay, oats and water type trainer. Um, and, and the results are showing in the breeding shed. Um, people are, are telling the industry with their money, I want to breed to this horse versus, you know, some of the other horses that have retired that are uh, at comparable stud fee prices and, and comparable farms. So I, I think that that's, you know, it's the old follow the money. And, and in this case, the breeders are recognizing um, excellence on the racetrack and, uh, and, and there's no you know, funny business that they, they feel like. So that's where they're putting their money. They're putting their money toward the more natural athletes that do it on their own volition. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, the, the pure test case of that was maximum security. Remember mm -hmm. when maximum security went to Coolmore and I, first of all, I never understood why they bought him in the first place. Trained by Jason service. He's by new year's day out of like an Anasheed mayor. Like I never understood why he was a stallion prospect to begin with, but you saw the way the market reacted to him. And it kind of made me feel bad for the horse. Cause it's like, right. it's not his fault. Like that, right. you know, that, that, that stuff was happening with him all along, but that was one of the cases where it was like, obviously the market is not going to react to this horse that even if there isn't ironclad proof of it yet, everybody just assumes from that 16,000 maiden claimer to the Derby, you know, has been enhanced along the way. And I think that that's such an interesting point that you make because that could have long lasting effects for the breed as well, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. if the market is naturally steering towards horses that they feel like are clean, as opposed to horses that they think are a little phony or a little juiced up over their racing career, then maybe we get sounder horses and better horses over time. But I just, you know, I, I've just, it's not something that jumped out to me necessarily, you know, in a big, bright red way, but it's just it's something I noticed like a little drip drip over time playing mm -hmm. the horses and reading the PPs and just not seeing things that make you sick because there were a lot of times as, as a horse player in the last 10, 15, 20 years where you just look at the PPs and it's like, this horse is in danger. You know, mm -hmm. this is, this is horses having something done to him that is not necessarily natural. And I don't want to be there when the other shoe drops just don't feel that way. I feel like I have a fairer shake as a horse player, but I feel better about the place that the horses are in. I think a big part of that goes to Heisa because, you know, it's not about drug positives necessarily. Deterrence is just as important as busting bad guys. If you have, if your program is robust enough that people think twice before going in and doing something illegal or something shady that they shouldn't be doing with a horse, that's good enough. And we never had that kind of deterrence before. Nobody was scared of the horse racing regulators or the gaming commissions. Like it just, it, it was not, yeah, it, it just seems like now there's actually a reason for people to think twice before they do something shitty with a horse. 
Yeah. And Joe, just one more, one more example that just in, in us talking, it made me think about it. You're also seeing a tremendous increase in claiming. And, and part of it is because, yeah, the, the, the pool of horses is, is, you know, smaller and, and there just aren't as many, there's not as much inventory. But in the past, I know when we were a claiming outfit, we would go to our trainer and say, Hey, what about this horse? And, you know, probably a third of the time, the trainer would say, you don't want to claim off that individual because the horses are going to come back to, to their regular form. Um, now that's not necessarily the case. People are claiming off of virtually everybody. Um, you know, there, there's no, there, there's no quote unquote, uh, sacred cow out there that, that you wouldn't claim off of. Um, so I, I think that's, that's also showing, um, some positive or having some positive influence in the industry also is just that, uh, you know, people are managing their horses properly. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that's an important role for the horses because then at least, you know, all right, in this population, this racetrack has this population of horses and they're going to kind of stay in that, in that range. So if I bring a horse in from outside, I know who my, you know, who my competitors are going to be. And if I have better numbers than them, then, then I should theoretically have the best horse in the race. Not, Hey, I think we're going to, we're going to win this race. And all of a sudden, you know, Joe Smith um, has a horse in there that he claimed for 10,000 and now it's, it's running for 25 and is running off the charts. Yeah. And that's what's part of the reason that I, that, that I didn't love the 60 minutes story because it's like, did you talk to regular people about where they are now, where we are now compared to where we were a couple of years ago? I think if you speak to most middle class trainers and horse players, they'll feel like they're getting a fairer shake. But you tell me if you're a middle class trainer or horse player, do you feel like it's more of a level playing field now? You have a better chance and you're not going to get beaten by a chemist as opposed to a trainer. Rail Talk is sponsored by Taylor Made. Shout out to the Taylor crew for getting through the bulk of the sales season. They always do a great job, whether the horse is a multi-million dollar horse that John Green owns or is a ten, twenty thousand dollar yearling. They treat every horse like they're the most important horse on the farm. They got a great crew of people who have been doing this for decades and do a good job, do a great job of taking care of the horses and the clients. They always do it with a smile. They have a good time. And not only does TaylorMade do a great job in the sales realm, but they also have TaylorMade stallions. And, you know, the roster for 2024 looks pretty damn strong to me. Obviously, it's top by not this time. $150,000 fee. You could argue that's a bargain, honestly, for the horses that he gets. Turf, dirt, short, long. You got Nick's Go. It's a $15,000 stud fee. Uh, you got Rowayton and Tacitus. Tacitus is an interesting one for me. Uh, I think he at $10,000 could be a bit of a bargain being by Tappet out of a grade one winning dam. Like I remember on the racetrack, people were like a little disappointed that he didn't win a thousand grade ones, but he was always there in big races showing up. So I think he's an interesting one for 2024. And one of the new ones for 2024 that I also have my eye on is Dr. Scheivel, uh at, by violence out of Little Nugget. 12500 is his stud fee. He was a dynamite sprinter and miler that I think had run up against some really, really, really good horses over his time. So maybe he didn't get the pub or the credit that he really deserved, but he was a terrifically fast horse. I love those violent sons as well. We've seen Forte already be a champion and is probably going to be pretty popular in the stallion barn, but a really nice roster. Go check them out at TaylorMadeStallions.com. Obviously not this time is the headliner, the the star of the star setter roster, but there's a lot of other horses at good price points that I think you can get a really nice runner from. You know, the racing season has died down a little bit now that the Breeders' Cup is over. We got the Clark and the big Churchill weekend this week on Thanksgiving. Um, and then we also have the Cigar Mile and then a little break till the Pegasus. But overall, there's not a ton going on. There was a lot going on Saturday at Aqueduct for me and the West Point team and the Woodford team with integration in the Hill Prince. Now, I wasn't around at West Point for Flight Lion. So to me, this is clearly the most and we have a lot of exciting horses. This is clearly the most exciting horse in the stable. If you haven't seen it, go watch the replay. Maybe we can put up the video of also of me with him back at the barn on Sunday because he's a total sweetheart as well. He's run three times. He hadn't, de he didn't debut until August of his three year old year. He'd had some minor issues, nothing serious, but Sugar is one, like I said last week, Sugar is one of those guys. He's just not going to run the horse unless he thinks they're a hundred percent right. And he's rewarded Sug and the team. He won his first race at, at, on the, uh, the, Secretary in the Arlington Million undercard at Colonial. I was there for that. It was hot as hell, but he was crazy impressive. Came back like three weeks later, not a typical Suge move, 
wins the Virginia Derby over a Chad Brown grade one winner, blew past him. And then Saturday in the Hill Prince, he was supposed to win, but he wasn't supposed to win like that. Drew away to win by five lengths, tied a 38-year-old Aqueduct turf course record for a mile and an eighth going 148 flat. Last eighth of a mile came in in 10.85 seconds. I think he came home in like 33 total or a little under. Like he just flew past me like a 757, dude. Like it was unbelievable to watch. Uh, maybe the Pegasus turf is next. He's John. I'm curious about this as, as a horse manager. He's kind of at a weird spot because he debuted so late that now he's really starting to get going. And I think Suge wants to have a really long 2024 campaign with him. So right. it's just like, what do you do? You don't want to put him on ice because he's so good right now and he's only getting better, but you also don't want to run him for like 15 straight months or whatever it is to get him to the Breeders' Cup next year. Anyway, just just very quickly, John, what was your impression of his race? And then kind of could you give a little insight into how you'd manage him? Yeah, I, I think like we talked last week, integration was just so impressive. And 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 Joe, it wasn't just because there was a dearth of racing. It was because he was just that impressive. I mean, it, it was it was a kind of a wow moment. And we talk about, you know, wow moments in, in, in racing. And and that was certainly one of them, um, you know, and, and you would expect a quality road from that kind of pedigree with Suge that the horse wouldn't start as a two year old. And, and, you know, just goes to show that like minor shit sometimes derails you and, and, and makes you wait a little bit more, but he's obviously been worth the wait and he's three for three. Um, Joe, I would think that, that again, not being in Shug's head, but my guess is that you're going to run him probably once in January or February and then go to Churchill Downs. And run in uh, in one of the graded stake races, uh, Derby weekend, Derby and Oaks weekend, and then kind of roll right into some of the bigger races in New York um, and and maybe Colonial Downs again. Although is Colonial going to have the Secretariat again or did they did they announce or they did they move that? I don't race? know if they're having the million there again next year. Yeah. I mean, it went pretty well. So I would, I would assume did. so, especially with everything that's going on with Churchill's turf course. I assume yeah. that's what they're going to do. Yeah, no, I would I would think so. But, you know, I'm curious to know where integration is going to go, because there may be kind of a match race setting up here, Joe, with 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 Web Slinger, with our, our Webby, um, you know, and and obviously Web Slinger isn't running the kind of numbers that integration is running um, right now. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, class you know, ultimately, you know, comes up with which obviously your horse has more class than mine. Um, is it <laughs> just like I got more class than you, buddy? You no, know, I didn't say that. I just said your horse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but, you know, we're going to run Web Slinger in the Hollywood Derby um, on December 2nd. We actually left him out in Santa Anita. Um, because we wanted him to, to not have to travel as much. And then we're going to kind of throttle him down for a little bit and and bring him back, you know, probably for Keeneland. So I, I would say that, you know, if not end of spring, beginning of summer, if these horses are both at that level and, and both sound, um, there, there may be a match race coming up, albeit with eight or nine other horses. But we'll, we'll pretend it's, a, it's kind of a match race between, between the two of us. But, Joe, I, I would have to say that, uh, that, that you know, integration really was impressive. And, and I think I texted it to you when you were there and we talked about it last week. Um, it, it's another talented horse that, that West Point Thoroughbred has. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not employed by West Point. I'm just telling you that that was a really fucking impressive race that he won. Yeah, it was like a jaw dropping race. And we have a, we have a couple other nice three year old turf horses too, Northern Invader, Ohana Honor. Um, so we got, a, we got a pretty loaded turf barn, I think for 2024. But yeah, he's like, He's he's one of those horses that I think breathes different different air, as they say. And so hopefully he can stay healthy and sound. We can get that match race with Web Slinger. I love Web Slinger. Don't think it's going to end too well for him, but we'll see. We'll see. There's a lot a lot of steps that we have to get between th- to, through between now and then. Are you guys going to make integration T-shirts? Because that's when I know the horse is for real. It's when you make T-shirts. <laughs> well, I I, I got to get my design guy or girl in Michelle's case. <laughs> to get on it. Can we like contract you out to get some integration charts done? Oh, uh, I guess, I guess we could work that out, but yeah, that that's, that's when you know you've made it is when you get right. a box in the mail and it's of your horse and it's like, Oh wow. Okay. Now I got to represent. Yep. Yeah. We got, we got to start printing up the merch. Uh, one other story I wanted to touch on before we get out of here. Uh, this broke re- uh, recently in the blood horse. I was, I think it's not a breaking story, but, <laughs> but it was reported in the, in the blood horse. Uh, that there were zero breakdowns at the Oklahoma track all year. 
And this is like the, the reason that this is a big deal is that Saratoga has become more or less a year round racing facility. Like there's there's nobody there in the winter. But for the most part, there's there are trainers there who, who you know, decided to stay up there like the Clements to keep a bunch of horses up there uh, just because it's it's like a really serene place for the horses to train. And the Oklahoma track takes a beating, man. Like if if you go up there and you watch training, there's it's a cut up track. They do a great job with renovation. But one of the things that I thought was interesting about the story is that it was a real horseman led effort, apparently, particularly mm-hmm. Chad Brown and Christoph Clement. Chad was, I think, one of the guys that really spearheaded this and there was a lot a lot of collaboration with him and glenn kozak and the people that run the backside at saratoga to make this happen because obviously it was a devastating summer on the saratoga main track but it's it's a success story and it's another success story that should be publicized that saratoga has had all of these horses thousands of horses training over it for months and months and months and there were no fatal issues and that's that can be replicable throughout the industry like obviously not every meet is going to be perfect but i just feel like we're seeing a lot more of these headlines these days that so and so's meet was uh, completed through without any breakdowns this this training track didn't have any breakdowns like John, these are the stories that need to be told, don't you think? It, it, they need to be publicized. They need to be expressed because, it, it, you know, Oklahoma isn't just a training track. Like, you know, Keeneland has a training track and and there's other uh, racetracks that have kind of pony tracks, you know, that that, that they allow horses to gallop over um, to give them, uh, you know, a little bit of relief. But the Oklahoma track is is utilized and breezed upon and and is expected to be kept, you know, up to a certain standard. So um, it was really, you know, delightful that you can read a story like that. I think that Naira... Um, is going out of their way to try to make sure that the racetracks are as safe as possible, um, right down to, you know, integrating and, and establishing a synthetic course, uh, at Belmont. Um, and, and there's rumors, Joe, that once that course is done, um, that, you know, that a few years from now, winter racing is going to be solely synthetic. Um, and, and that makes sense because, you know, it works in Woodbine, it works in Turfway, other cold weather, um, you know, uh, environments. And it's just safer for the, it, the statistics show that it's safer for the horses. So kudos to, to Saratoga um, and Naira for having a great exemplary, um, you know, uh, re- report card for Oklahoma. I mean, for the main track, it's a different story. But for Oklahoma, it should be recognized that, that they did really well. Um, and also that they're going to try to employ additional safety measures to uh, make racing better. Joe, do you know why? That racetrack is called Oklahoma. God, I should. This is like very embarrassing that I can't think of it. I feel like I knew it at one point, but go ahead. So I don't remember the trainer, but a very high profile trainer was trying to get stalls at Saratoga and they had just built uh, barns over on the other side of of the racetrack. And uh, they came up to him and said, hey, Joe, you know, where where are you stabled? Because I didn't see you in your regular barn. And he goes, I'm so far away from the racetrack. I might as well be in fucking Oklahoma. And ever since then, it's been called Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. All right. Those those racetrackers, man. Those gruff guys. Always got <laughs> got some good lines. I'm glad that one that one stuck around. But no, this is a, this is a big deal. And I think, like I said, the, the other key is that the horsemen had a big part in it as well. That it's just ev- everybody is aligned in wanting to keep their horses safe. And we've seen that collaboration at Del Mar and Santa Anita too. That horsemen have to be part of the solution. It can't just be track management. And, you know, shout out to Chad and the people that worked with Naira to accomplish this. Let's keep it going. All right. So that's going to do it for episode 19 of Rail Talk. This was a great time. Thank you to Lisa Lazarus, as as always, for stopping by and answering questions. I want to thank my co-pilot, John Green, our producer, Patty Wolf, I guess, our associate producers, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you to the sponsors. Maybe you can celebrate this season of giving by re-upping with us and giving us some more money to keep doing the show. <laughs> And thank you to you, the viewers and the listeners. I want you all to have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. And we'll see you back here next week on Rail Talk.